Welcome to this week's episode of Work the Left Side. Uh, I am more than honoured to announce this week's guest, uh, whether it be as Greg Burridge, Darren Burridge, Baxter Burridge, Metallico, a man of many names and many skills. Uh, of course, it's Mr. Greg Burridge. How are we going, mate? You right? I do, mate. I'm, I'm impressed. You remember Baxter Burridge? That was my first wrestling name. <laughs> yeah, yeah I've, been, uh, I've had a fun afternoon doing a little bit of research. Uh, yeah. And yeah, mate, I'd say it's like obviously what 2002 was, was the starting point, as you sort of said. Away, this is me little boy. He's got socks in his mouth. So, sell out to the internet, Rocky. Hello, mate. So, he's <laughs> just fighting and snorting. It's not me, it's me little one. <laughs> yeah, what, what, what did you find on the internet about me then? Uh, well, uh, well, obviously, your first part of call was I mean, we talked about it previously because I asked you what. Uh, Grab Foo was so yeah. IMDb was my first port of call, which is strange because normally it's cage match. But I was look, I was more interested. I I know a lot about your wrestling and stuff because I've been following British wrestling for ten plus years. So I kind of wanted to venture over to the other stuff uh, and have a look at like, the films and the stunts and all that kind of you know everything else you've been involved in. So yeah, IMDb uh, obviously makes reference to uh, you are the master of Grab Foo. Yeah. And uh, we'll start with that, mate. Uh, if you don't mind, just obviously make people aware. I, I presume, obviously, it's a fighting style mixed with stunts, mixed with other yeah, stuff. Yeah, basically, around. Um, I've always wanted to get into film anyway, as much yeah. as I did want to get into wrestling, which I guess is, is most kids at school. But somewhere along the line, life or some twatty teacher tells them that's not possible. <laughs> and I, I've, I, I take that as a challenge. I always have. I remember, like my teachers telling me, it's, it's not possible. I'm like, fucking is. It's like, it's you should never tell someone no, in terms yeah. of like that's not possible. Because, what do they know? Have they been there? Have they tried? Have they tried and failed? Is that why they're saying no? So I always, I, I always believe anything is possible. I've got it tattooed on my leg. It's anything is possible. Um, <clears throat> so. I knew that it wasn't going to be easy, but I knew I had the self-belief and the confidence to make it happen. So basically, I became a wrestler against everyone's kind of belief. Um, this, you know, lower class, like underperforming, the silt at the bottom of the, not the actual crap, but that little silt that floats just above the muck. You know, that was kind of me, just forgotten about, not really... Um, expected to do much but again that was fuel for my fire and I made it work for me and I became what I wanted to be was a wrestler I didn't do what everyone else at my school did like go work in a bank or go work with their dad building all this kind of stuff I, I did what I'm doing that's become a professional wrestler um I took that kind of <clears throat> mentality into film I'm going to make my own film you can't make your own film that's impossible I made my own film on a thousand pounds and only did I make it on a thousand pounds I got it um, off to the Cannes Film Festival and I got it sold at Cannes and it opened doors for me to go and work with like like get on still cover DVD covers with my idol Scott Atkins and have a fight scene with him you know and that's what happens when you don't listen to the people that say you can't do it you can do it if after people told Will Ospreay he can't do something would he be the be in the position he is now you know that's why I'm very like, like me and Will, we, we literally come from the same the same background, the same area. So <clears throat> I do live vicariously through Will, but that's a, we'll get onto that later. But um, this is what annoys me. I made that film. I put so much hard work into making that film, writing that script. I, I did everything myself. I edited the film. Um, and that film cost me a thousand pounds to make. That's an absolutely phenomenal thing to do. Like, yep. you even though where, where you'd start to make your own film, just not to be arrogant, but would you know the first thing about making your own film? No. I'm a massive film geek and I wouldn't have a clue yeah. where to start. It's, it's fucking hard, dude. <laughs> it's the post-production, it's the line ed editing, it's the script writing, it's the, it's the actual learning how to make something from your imagination, make it a f the ether, and make it an actual solid form, this piece of art that is coherent and makes sense, that's something that not should, shouldn't be looked at lightly. Plus, 
I haven't got, I didn't at the time have any skills in editing, any skills in directing, but I had directed 2,000 you know, odd matches because a movie is just a wrestling match. There's a start, as a middle, as a finish. And sometimes we don't even have to use, we can't verbalise anything. We have to tell the story of our bodies. Oh. So this is what prepared me to make that film. And I took that, that, that wrestling knowledge and that wrestling approach to wrestling to making London Rampage. Um, but the thing that gripes me about that film is that not a lot of people have seen it, <laughs> you know, especially in Britain. It is available on Amazon Prime. It was Amazon, it was on Amazon, is on Amazon Prime now. Uh, it was available on YouTube um, and on a pay to watch subscription. Oh. But that's the thing that annoyed me about that film. I put all this work and effort in and I kind of stepped back from wrestling. Rocky. I, I stepped back from wrestling for three, three or four years. Um, and that was my biggest mistake because everybody forgot who I was, you know. Rocky, come here. <laughs> um, I, well, not to disagree. Uh, I wouldn't say people forgot who you were. Obviously, I think you've achieved you know, plenty up to that point. Like you kind of stamped your mark on British wrestling. Um, Here's the thing. I, I did. I, I did step my mark on wrestling. Yeah. Like there's this thing called the UK Fan Forum, right? Do you remember the UK Fan Forum? Vaguely. Yeah. So UK Fan Forum was, and again, this is a diss that anyone who loves wrestling has been wrestling the last ten years. It's just an education into what came before, and perhaps that's my role in in the business now to educate people what was before them because they don't know because <laughs> there wasn't such a thing as the internet so basically you're only, only going to get knowledge you know obviously from the last 10 years of wrestling so i was voted on the uk fan forum which is a, a big forum a big thing at the time all the wrestlers went on in all the fans of the uk were on the uk fan forum and they had a vote for the top 50 wrestlers of the year and i came one year i came uh, fourth and then the next year on my only my my fourth year of wrestling, I came second, and the only person that beat me was Doug Williams. And Doug Williams, the next year, was took out of that because he well, he wasn't classed as an independent wrestler anymore because he was now a champion. So, in theory, I, I came first. <laughs> I won. Yeah, that works. Uh, oh, but yeah, that's what I mean. So I know you're saying you took a few years out, uh, but I yeah. think you had done enough by that point to, like I say, you made your stand. People um, who appreciate will remember you would know who you were um obviously you kind of went off to do the they, you know the they film can, thing they can like they can appreciate that right but to someone who's only just got in the business they just think i was the dude who trained will osprey <laughs> okay. if, if they know that right and that's my that's what pisses me off about about the scene you know people just they, they think wrestling you know started 10 years ago or the people that did watched wrestling when I was a, a, a bigger name, a household name, so to say, they've moved on and they've got families, which is totally understandable. You know, they don't watch wrestling no more or for, for whatever reason, they've grown up and they, they've fallen out of love with it. But there's a whole generation of people that were in the business that are now left, but they gave their bodies for this business. You know, I think we, we, you, they all owe it to respect what they did to, to, to give people like will and uh, all these new guys coming for a chance to, to be superstars and to go on and get AEW contracts go work for the wwe appear on wwe games it couldn't have been possible if uh, like the people before us didn't pass the way i was always i was told when i when i started wrestling about the, the generation before me people like flash barker who's a fwa wrestler um johnny storm to a certain extent jody all these guys that paved the way and it was just at the wrong generation because they didn't make it to the big time and the big time is tv tv oh. contract right this is before youtube and things okay so th it doesn't matter no more the big thing at the time is getting a tv contract and i oh, look at these guys that paved the way for us to get on tv i feel so sorry for them but little did we know it was us the generation that paved the way for the, the first tv generation we was the guys that this slightly fell fell short of becoming superstars, you know. Yeah. So, uh, which is cool, that's fine. But I just think people now, especially the new generation of the one PW fans, need to know what came before them. 
because when I was at Lincoln, I did a Q and A with a couple of uh, VIP ticket holders, and I, I asked them. I said, um, "How many of you in this building were here for the, the first ever One PW show?" And not not one of them people put their hand up. Wow. And I was like, okay. and I said, "So, like, who here is a new fan to One PW?" And all of them put their hands up, and I was like, "I was a little bit shocked." And I went, "Wow, they didn't even know. They don't even know what <laughs> what came before them, you know." Wow. So it's uh, interesting, and it was yeah. the same the same thing when I did my did I did my match with Colt. I mean, Colt, we tagged up and we took on um, Doug and Nick. Yep. Went out to the Doncaster Dome. It's strange because that place is home to me, but it didn't it didn't really feel like home. If that makes sense, it just it felt like half the audience kind of knew who I was, and the other half were like, "Who's this dude? Who's this fucking?" nugget with his dice hanging out his pants <laughs> <laughs> but um no again totally understand because yeah, i was at the first show uh, i was going to mention um johnny and jody to you because i was going to mention yeah. when one pw first started obviously it was very reliant on sort of imports because there wasn't as many uh, british wrestlers weren't uh, a mainstream sort of household name to a lot of people um to the people that would have been buying the tickets and stuff but yourself johnny jody and madman uh were probably the four top it might for me in my opinion uh like you were the top four british guys yeah. that were pulling in you know representing britain at a british promotion yeah i think so i think that's fair to say um yeah, what well, I think what what we did there was 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 amazing, really, in terms of like we we came in there as well. I I speak for myself. I came in there as like a like a no one, you could say, and then I I I, I was made a superstar by the fans to a to a link and an equal level as as um Steve Carino and AJ Styles and all these people. People came to watch me wrestle as much as they did the the imports, you know, um, which says a lot. I think it says a lot yeah. to, to what we it, did. And obviously you had some, you know, banging matches, you know, at one PW against some of these guys, you know, you was involved with matches with, you know, Corey Graves or SJK, as you went by at the time, AJ Styles, Chris Daniels, uh, obviously, you know, you went up against Johnny and Jody as well. Uh, and just, yeah, I'm not going to reel off all the names, but, you know, you were used as a, as a star at one PW. And for, I'm generally surprised that the people at the meet and greet, that there was nobody there that was at the first show. That amazes me. Yeah, it, it's, it's a strange feeling, dude. It's a strange feeling. It's kind of like, it's kind of like you just think, you just reflect on what, what it is you, you did. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, you don't question what you've done, but you like, Fucking what happy with I've done for the last 20 years if no one can remember it. I, I when I die, right? Here's the thing. I don't just want to be a number. I just want to be another statistic. I wanna don't wanna die a number. I wanna die a letter. I wanna die a series of letters. You know, Greg Burridge, he did this, he led the way for that. And I gave my life to pro wrestling. I absolutely gave 150% of my life. I dedicated everything. I dedicated like uh, relationships, social life, career, all these other things that coming back to school, you shouldn't do that. You need to go and get a proper job. Now, fuck that. I'm going to be a pro wrestler and take a gamble. It came with a sacrifice. You know, wrestling back then wasn't as acceptable as it is today. When people look at you and you say, I'm a pro I, I, I trained to be a pro wrestler. They thought you was mental. They literally thought he was mental and they just kind of looked down at you. And it was a stigma, stigma that we carried and we got on with it and <laughs> we made it work. And there wasn't all these Western schools like there are now. There was like two schools. And I trained first at Drop Kicks, which was an, a great school at the time. Um, and I was honoured to have that, that school around the corner for me, really. And when I say around the corner, it was a two and a half hour drive or two and a, two and a half hour trip every Sunday. But I would have travelled halfway to Scotland if it meant I was going to be a pro wrestler. And that's another thing. All these wrestlers today, they moan if there's a wrestling school on the wrong side of town. So, you know, it's you just ask, you just question, you, you ask yourself, like, what am I doing? If, if, if like, all those great matches I had, 
all those great matches I had that I also lost because the idiots didn't recall them properly or they're stuck in some legal contract stuff, which is quite a few of the 1PW shows. Like, for instance, me and Colt versus uh, Nigel McGuinness and Doug Williams for the Noah Tag Titles, forever lost in time. One of the greatest matches ever. Colt Cabana's last match before he went WWE. Amazing match. Lost. Will never be watched because it's stuck in wherever. My match with AJ Styles, my singles match with AJ Styles, where I beat him, where he went to get me into the, uh, the Styles Clash, I reversed it, and I put him into the, the, the Chav Lock, which is my submission, and I beat him. Again, lost. You know? So it's like, uh, what, is an, what is available? Oh, what my shit match I had with Madman Manson and Damnation, where we was told to drop the titles or whatever, or, or you know, like, where Manson had a mental breakdown halfway through the match, and it was just weird. Oh, that's available. That's in the shops. That's in HMV. <laughs> so it's like, you know, half your, half your stuff is when people don't like know who you are or, or where you've been, you just think, well, what's my legacy? Was it all worth it? Was it worth me breaking my body, break, um, ACL reconstruction on one knee, all my body parts hurting every morning when I wake up, not having those relationships, missing out on those social activities, not going out on a Friday night because I trained at home in my gym, you know. You think, was it worth it for to, to go to Lincoln and to a bunch of, like, wrestling fans to, like, you know, don't even know who I am? So, again, uh, I can only speak for one person. For me, I would say, yes, uh, I appreciate, you know, thank you. Um, but it's not just that. You've obviously got the, you say you've got the school, you've got the uh, London School of London, uh, Lucha Libre, um you, you know you, what you've achieved there as well it's not just what you've achieved in the in the ring over the years you know you've you've left your mark in numerous places um yeah obviously the school man that's how did you get into that you know was that something you, did you think like was it just to kind of not, not, not wind down but did you just want to pass on the wisdom or did you just so i actually started up london school lucha libre with uh my mate Gary Vanderholm and uh, we ran out at the Resistance Gallery in um, London and I don't know if you've ever been to Resistance Gallery but it was a fucking cool little venue it was, a, it was in an underground arch in Bethlehem right. Green um, down this dodgy road we called the Batcave because you had to go under a tunnel to get there and it was kind of like in, in the Batcave and it was a little old cobbled Victorian road you chuck a right and you go down these still doors you open the still doors and suddenly there's a you know there's a wrestling ring and a bar which is great. It was an amazing place. It's not there no more. Um, but we first opened that, opened that place up in 2007 um, when Bethnal Green was super rough and it was like national front graffiti on the walls out front and like just crazy stuff. But um, it was actually like an, an LGBTQ friendly, invite, friendly, uh, friendly um, event space is what we originally what we're there to do um at that time beth and the green like the the gay community was getting quite big and there wasn't really uh, as many safe areas for them to go around in because there was at the time there was gangs going around beating up beating up um like gays and lesbians and, and giving them hassle so being wrestlers <laughs> They knew they could come to our venue and we would look after them. And I was on the door. I was head of security on the door. And we made sure no, no, no none of these gangs were going around or um, they couldn't get in for a start. But we gave them a safe environment to come and hold their events. And that was what we, we did. But we also run our wrestling school from there. Um, and we kind of built up a name and a following with that audience and that crowd and with the wrestling. And, you know, not even the wrestling fans, because... We opened up that school to get away from the toxicity of British wrestling because there was a lot of it, a lot of male masculine energy and this kind of stuff. We're just going to leave all that bullshit behind. We're going to do our thing. We're going to open a wrestling school to everyone who's been told they can't wrestle. They're not allowed or they get bullied or they're this or that or they, you know, they like that's what we did. And that was the London School of Libre and it was super successful. We had, um, we had, so many amazing students come through that school and so many students that that would not have lasted in any other schools because they got bullied out and there was a lot of this going around at the time um including osprey you know 
he would have got like if he went anywhere else, he would have got bullied out in a week, two weeks even. Um, so yeah, we, we set that up and then we run our promotion, Lucha Britannia, which again is, is is the birth child of Gary Vanderhorn. He brought me on as like the technical advisor, and I helped shape it into a more okay. Like when he first started doing shows, there was like naked dudes in the crowd. <laughs> it's like that vibe. It's like fetish orientated. Guys in guys and girls in latex masks, you know, wrestling in torture garden. <laughs> awesome, you know. But we thought, no, perhaps we should make it a little bit more mainstream. So, uh, you know, we, we kind of made it a little bit more main, mainstream, and then we made Lucha Britannia like the greatest night out in London. Like we want our aim was to get it in the back the back page of, of like a Ryanair or a Easy Jet magazine when you get on a plane. Things to do in London, and we did that. We we got that in the back of one of the the magazines one one time. Um, so yeah, it just the, the two helped each other. It's like like you look, you come to the wrestling school. Don't worry about all these other promotions going on. We're going to train you for our promotion. We're going to get on Lucha Britannia. You're going to do festivals. We did download before WWE and Progress. Um, we did um, Reading Festival, Leeds Festival. We did all these big festivals, big promotions, big 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 turnout, and we got all the guys ready to do our show. Um, Including Will, we had his first match at, um, for Lucha Britannia right there in the in the uh, in the Resistance Gallery. So yeah, it was just it was um, it was just a safe place to train where you wasn't going to get judged and you can you can flourish and become the best that you could possibly be. And that was my skill. I've always noticed how to get the best out of someone, and I always could see how to make them a star or what their gimmick should be or what they was missing. Um, and doing it in a way where, and coming from a background where I was told, I was always called, told you can't. I was like, I'll never tell any of these people here they can't. I said, you can. I don't care your size, your gender, your ethnic background, whatever. You can. You just got to want it that much. Um, and we we did that. We created people like Cara Noir. We created um, like Nina Samuels came from there. Um, and just 110 wrestlers that you would have never heard of. But we made their dreams come true, even if it was just one match, you know. Yeah. We've made their dreams come true, and that's such a rewarding experience. Uh, like Cassius, have you got? Have you heard of Cassius? Neon Explosion, really good wrestler, making waves at the minute. He came for our, our doors. So yeah, it was just um, something I was I, I was good at, um, and we run that school for eleven years before it shut down in two thousand and twenty. 21 because basically it's it became too much to to afford to to rent a place in london because that's what happens in london now it's just crazy <laughs> much to, you know i was actually um, spoke to one of your students uh, a couple of weeks ago joshua jackson he kind of picked it up yeah. uh, joshua jackson uh, i spoke to him a couple of weeks ago and he was picking it up saying you know, you know it, was a, it was an amazing experience yeah it was good like we, we did this thing called the lucha warm-up and it was like an hour but <laughs> Okay, you'd get all these guys coming from other schools and they come with an ego. Yes, <laughs> and like, yeah, we're going to fucking rock. And I was like, watch this. I'm going to break your ego in one hour. I'm going to actually crush it. Because I don't have fat wankers, bullies, all this shit. I don't have it, you know, and I get rid of them. But I said, look, the first test is the Lucha warm up. Well, I make you become and make a total idiot of yourself. I'll make you shout. I'll make you pretend you're, you, you know, you're drunk. And I'm, I'll, we'll do this absolutely crazy lunatic warm up with the lights off. And it's like a one hour rave on a, on a Monday. But what it also does to me, it also says to me, it was a test. It was like, are you willing to do what I ask you to do? Are you willing to let the guard down also? And are you, do you trust in me? And that you could tell because the minute I'd say jump your hands at the end, go whoop, 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 on your first lesson. If you didn't do it and you felt self conscious, you wasn't going to last. But if you just went, fuck it, I'm going to do it because everyone else is doing it, <laughs> joining in, joining in with the fun, you'd go, oh, okay, I get the idea of this place now. We're all here to make fun of ourselves. We're not here to make fun of others. We're all in it together. We're all a team. We're all a family. And that was what was important to me. So the Lucha warm-up was, was a great warm-up. You'd walk out of a set of abs after, but it was a psychological test as well, you know, as much as a physical one. So that was the start of the lesson. And that was one of the reasons a lot of people came, just for the warm-up, I think. But, um, <laughs> yeah. yeah but, uh, 
like you're saying though about yeah obviously back in the day uh I've, I've spoken to you know sticks and rj singh about this you know they were sort of saying many, many years ago um you have you have to travel like two two and a half three hours to get to a school uh but it seems like you know there's there's always there's a school within half an hour away now no matter where you live kind of thing yeah. you know school seems to be popping up all over the shop uh well, but that's a in rj is rj RJ tell you how he got his name? No. So I was in the car with Ross and he was on the way to his FWA, his first FWA show. So because we all brung it, we'd all came into the business together as trainees, right? Um he was, he was on the in the car going, What's my name gonna be? I don't know what my name's gonna be, what should I call myself? <laughs> it's kind of, uh, what about like Ross Singh? No, it doesn't sound right. Rosh Panisha, all this kind of stuff. And he, and he went to page three of The Sun, and there was a photo of Jordan. And he went, what about Rosh Jordan? Fuck it. Yeah, that'll do. Boom. Rosh Jordan. And then uh, that became RJ. <laughs> wow. That, so it's basically, we have Jordan to thank for the RJ Singh name. Yeah. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Forgive Kate <laughs> all of the sins she gave us RJ Singh. But Stixie, uh, he actually... See, me and Sticks, again, we trained together <clears throat> at the same time. We, we started together. And uh, we went to work for Brian Manelli on the camps. And Brian Manelli was... I'll always thank Brian Manelli because Brian Manelli gave me my break in the business. I trained at Drop Kicks. He came and saw me and he took me on the camps. And wrestling school's all good, but you it's like passing your driving test. You pass your driving test, now get on the road. It's only when you get on the road, you actually learn how to drive. And it's the same with wrestling. You can go to a wrestling school to be blue in the teeth. It's only once you get into the shows, wrestling those matches, you really learn to wrestle. We're just giving you the tools you need to get in that ring with. And me and Sticks started together with Brian Minnelli. And sometimes we'd wrestle each other and sometimes we'd wrestle um, Brian Minnelli as the Phantom or Mickey West. Again, legends. Um, um, and Jace the Ace, Jace the Ace, one of my favorite wrestlers ever. They taught us how to work, you know, they taught us how to work, and it was going up and down holiday camps around Britain, you know, for 20 pounds a job. That was the thing, you know, but we loved it, you know, absolutely loved it. Putting the ring up twice a day, ring up and down twice a day, going around all the camps of, of, of the UK, and that's where we learned our trade. So, I, I always got a fun place in my heart for Stixie because um he's an old school he's he's paid his dues and he's he's, he's got his own school and um we had our first match together our first like one of our first matches together for um Brian Dixon at the Fairboard Halls uh, rest in peace Brian so yeah it's um yeah that's my that's my Stixie story but he's a good lad Stixie <laughs> He is, he is very, very cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I like sticks. Um, but yeah, well, you mentioned the holiday camps there. Uh, I mean, obviously, you mentioned as well, it kind of ties into people only knowing stuff that's online or things like that. But you can talk about like All Star, for example. Uh, I was speaking to somebody last week about All Star. You know, I don't think there's anything. And if you've ever had a match at All Star, that doesn't appear on Cage Match or that doesn't appear on any databases. So that's like half, you know, that's 100 matches plus that nobody knows about. Uh, totally like it's, it's a double-edged sword because i can sit and i can moan about oh you guys don't know this and that and it's not on that um but also why are those matches not on cage match should all star be making more of an effort to modernize their style and, and be on that and because this is the argument but what i think it comes down to is there's many styles of pro wrestling yeah I am not a fan of this internet generation wrestling. Okay. I believe all wrestling should be one thing. Should be one thing. Should be one art form. But right. the way, way it is now, you've got your family, family friendly shows, right? Yeah. And then you've got your smart mark indie internet show, right? What's happened is those indie independent shows have took over the ether of what wrestling should be or, or is, right? But when I did my first match for, for All Star, which was 2002, it was at Fairfield Halls. 
<clears throat> and the guys came backstage and went, oh, it's a bad crowd tonight, really bad. And I went, how many's in? A thousand. Oh, it's getting bad. And I was like, whoa, a thousand people. <laughs> yeah, but they were all going to shit house, shit house. And I said, out of curiosity, what, what's it usually? So 2,000. And they said, you see that curtain at the back? Went, yeah, they've pulled it across. If you go up, there's more seats. So that was my first show. It was 1,000 people, right? But again, that's not on Cage Match. It's not none of this. But some stupid independent show with, with some XWE wrestler and we'll get all over the internet because, you know, an, an attendance of 300 people, you know, that's a big show. But it's like, well, not really because <laughs> it's like when I – first started doing those shows brian danielson was there learning the business and he would do the tour of all-star you know i vividly remember brian danielson sitting there eating a jar of peanut while i was in the changing room just a, bit, a jar of peanut butter and a bit of bread you know and that's no us being big wrestling big in, independent wrestling fans but oh, that's, that's the american dragon you know, yeah that's brian. but it's kind of like he wasn't there for that he wanted to learn the other side of wrestling you know but you could argue if he didn't understand or learn that side of wrestling would he have been where he is today so i think to get into the places like the wwe and the AEW, it's it was anyway absolutely vital that you did come to england and work for all star and learn how to work yep learn how to work the audience and the problem with the internet your cage matchy stuff is especially in 2023 wrestlers are trained not to work the audience no more but to work the cameras and it's so shit it's so shit because if you're going there to watch live wrestling and you're on the wrong side of the, the arena yeah you've wasted your money they're not looking at you they're doing this the whole time and you know what da, 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 da. And then they walk off. How rude. They don't even look at you, right? Whereas I was never taught that way. I was taught the camps way, you know, the all-star way. You work that whole building, you know. There are no cameras at all-star. There are no cameras at the camps. We work the people, the audience, you know. That's that's who's paying the ticket. And that's what I was. I was always a live, a live audience wrestler. I never liked the internet style and the working the cameras and always knowing your mark. It's not my style. So should promotions like All Star modernize, become more cage match and style and more internet savvy? I don't think so because there's a whole generation of wrestling that's absolutely getting destroyed at the minute, and that's the family friendly kind of let's say All Star vibe wrestling shows, which I think there need to be more of. You know? Yeah. Um, well, God, yeah. I mean, you just got to look at like say you mentioned Brian Danielson, uh, obviously Cash Wheeler, half of FTR. I don't care, went through the holiday camps, the uh, Viking experience, Raiders, whatever you want to call them. They've worked all star. There's probably obviously a, an absolute ton of people I don't know. Um, speaking to Nathan Cruz, um, a lot of the people that seem to be very good character wrestlers or promos seem yeah. to have obviously gone through all star or the holiday camps because it helps you to just work on the foundations, build on that engage an audience and be able yeah. to tell a story more because you, the, the people there are there yeah. not as wrestling fans they're there to be entertained there's too many wrestlers now that have, like they have no charisma i've got more charisma in four of my pubes right? <laughs> a lot of these these guys that call themselves wrestlers and they, they they're like exposing the business so much it annoys me and you have to be a super fan of wrestling just to appreciate what they're doing and ignore the leg slaps you know the, these kind of shitty leg slaps you have to ignore that to get into the you know enjoy what you're, you're you've paid your 50 pounds to watch whatever whereas i was never someone who'd go out and give you a, a technical match i was more a character-based wrestler i believe that threw a bit of technical wrestler in, wrestling in there or some bigger moves but why why are why aren't all wrestlers that <laughs> why don't all wrestlers have a, like a character too many wrestlers are scared of the word gimmick they think gimmick means you have to come out like a postman holding a, a, a mail bag that's not what it means gimmick is someone who's larger than life someone that doesn't look like your next door neighbor someone who's not scared to interact one-to-one -one. 
Yep. One to one to one to one to one to one with a thousand people around a building to make lock on eye contact. That's why the family the, the friendly shows and these the, the camp shows are important because that's what it trains you. They're literally in front of you there. There's a three year old kid screaming at you. What are you gonna do? You know, because sometimes you've got to hold your own with a lot of these people. Because if you don't and you shy away, you fucked it. <laughs> you because then the crowd become awkward for you as well. You have to go out there and you have to perform. The minute you you leave yourself at that curtain. When you walk through that curtain, you're someone else. You're that character. That's what it means to have a character, you know, a gimmick. You leave yourself in the changing room. You come out and you become, embrace that energy of, of, of whatever character it is. So doing the camps is kind of like level one, learn to become a wrestler, to get to AEW, to get to Ring of Honor, you know, to get to these other places. It's your building block, your foundation. You need a strong foundation. Too many promotions now in schools aren't remembering that block and they don't know that block because they haven't done the camps they haven't done the all-star shows they're going straight on to like like the more indie style of wrestling that's the hardest way for a pro wrestler to learn how to work the hardest way you know so and that's you kind of you're trained to do a different style of wrestling you're trying to do an internet style of wrestling which i'm not opposed to but if i'm bringing my five-year-old you know, child to a show, and suddenly I'm seeing these guys slap their legs, and it, the moves don't make sense, and she's not—they're not interacting with us or the crowd. You're not going to bring your kid back, especially if they start swearing, which a lot of them do. It gets a little bit too too crazy. The kid's not got to enjoy themselves, so you've just alienated a whole next generation of pro wrestling fans because it's not going to come again they could go home and watch power rangers or whatever it's called these days on tv so the important thing with family friendly audiences and camp shows is that's what it does it really does bring the next generation into the business which is why it needs there needs to be more of it it doesn't need to be on cage match every week these these shows you do it needs to be kind of contained in its own its own microcosm of entertainment industry so wrestlers can learn but then the fans can appreciate what pro wrestling is and get and get that love for it i got my love for it from watching on warrior get voodoo spelled and black paint come out of his face <laughs> and he beat up papa shungo you know yeah. get into it I'll, from I'll, I'll say ways, the macho man getting bit on the arm it's all about the showmanship it was the That's story right. it was the um yeah, you know, I've had this conversation uh, with numerous people about it's the moments people, it's the yeah. moments people remember in wrestling. You know, you can have five star matches. Yeah. But yeah, it's the moments that, that stand out. They're, they're what's important. Um, yeah. But yeah, to me, one, obviously... thing, one thing that's changed that didn't change my opinion, and it only happened the other day. And it was, uh, I really want to remember who it was. Some wrestlers said there's that the five types of wrestling. You know, and your, your WWE style is your, your showmanship style, but your British style is your technical style. Your Japanese style is your strong style. And each of them had their own audience. And I went, you know what? That's the first time in 21 years, 22 years of being a wrestler. I've sat back and gone, OK, so we're aiming these things to different audiences. But my whole belief is, why aren't we just being one wrestler that can fit and adapt to everything? You know? And that's what I've always done. I've never tried to change my style for a certain promotion. I've just kept it how I was. Because when you go to the when you go to the the, um, the circus, I don't just want to see fifteen clowns. <laughs> I want to see a bit of a giraffe and some dude getting fired out of a cannon and this and that. But now everyone is just doing the same thing. Plus, they're forgetting that it's a live show, and they're all having the same match. They're all doing the same stuff in the match. But it doesn't matter because the promoter is going to cut it up and sell it on the internet anyway. So it won't matter. So the way that people digest wrestling has changed where they just watch a match and then move on, which, again, is kidding live wrestling, you know. So it's important that we keep these kind of promotions running so we don't fuck up the business in 10 years, you know. And that's my belief. Yeah, you know? no, I agree. Because, um, like you said, as a wrestler, you don't want to... You don't want to be able to do everything as a promotion. You want to be able to do everything or you want to be able to showcase everything. So it's varied. So you've got a bit of this, you've got a bit of that. Yeah. Um, somebody once said, um, when I was chatting to him, you know, when they go to a show, they'll look at the match card, see, you know, who's doing what, who's fighting who. And if they, if they're 
if they want to do high flying, if they sort of see somebody on there that's a renowned high flyer, they're like, okay, no, I'll I'll be more technical tonight because that guy's got to obviously yeah. smash it doing high flying stuff. I'll do something else, and that's what yeah, just mix it up, you know. That, yeah, that, that sure. was me, like, like that. That was like when I first started. You was you was told where you was on a card, how long you had, and what you had to do. Don't do these moves because he's doing like. I was the only dude that wore orange. No fucker dead wear orange when I was on the show. That's how it was, you know. But that's that's his colours. He's orange. Oh, okay. Well, this tonight I'm going to wear this. You're a face and I'm a heel. Why, if you're a face, are you wearing black pants? You know, you're a good guy. Wear something better. And why are you, as a heel, wearing that colour? You know, it's like that's how we was brought into the business, you know, to understand... It's the small things that mean the most. Um, so, God, I forgot my point. But um, no, but if the mind, it's the details. It's the attention to detail that takes the show up a level. Yes, it's all about the credibility and and like keeping an element of kayfabe alive for the fans' sake. Because I don't really believe there's anything as a there's a mark is not a mark. A mark is a fan that loves wrestling so much that it, it takes a lot for him to get that that pop, you know. So that's all a mark is. So it's our job. Like it doesn't mean you have to work harder. You just have to shock them. You have to surprise them because they're just a fan that loves the business so much. Yeah. So, yeah. That's it. Yeah, because I mean, yeah, being a mark's not a bad thing. It's just obviously the passionate about you know the wrestling. Um, yeah, I thought it makes it. Let me uh, rephrase it. Mark, Mark. Sorry. Let me rephrase it. Not a mark. Nothing wrong being a mark. Mark, Mark. Okay. Yeah. I'm the biggest mark because I decided I wanted to do this as a career. You know? <laughs> I, gave, um, I gave my life to, to wearing spandex with, you know, <laughs> like, I'm the biggest mark here. So, yeah, it's all good. Again, it's it's um, a lot of wrestlers of you have hold their hands up. And be like, you, you must be mocked because you don't put the hours you put in, the effort you put in, everything like that. You yeah. can't be a mark if you want to be successful. So, yeah. That's a lot of dedication hard work to be a pro wrestler. You know, we did, it was a lot harder in my day. And that's not me being an old, old boy, which is a lot harder. Now it's a lot easier, you know. But the reason it's a lot easier because people like me and people like Stixie, we, we help pave the way for a new generation to come in. Didn't have to go through all the bullshit we had to, or the bullshit yep. that just for us. I read a book, right? And it's called The Wrestling. And it's one of the books that got me into wrestling. And I forgot who was in it, but it's a really good book to pick up. It's got like some legends in it with James, Ma James Mason was another guy I idolised, you know, because um, of this book, actually. Um, some guy went for a tryout. Like some guy turned up to a wrestling school. And again, you don't, just turn up to a wrestling school you kind of had got to get invited so they got this guy to, to go to the wrestling school and on day one they popped his eyeball out <laughs> with a fuck it fell out and then the guy stepped on it with his heel so it burst right fucking horrible right absolutely disgusting to see if he'd come back again and he did and i went like, it's a horror story. Like, your eye getting popped out, laying on the canvas, and the guy just putting it, like, slowly slipping back and putting his heel on it. And apparently yeah. that, that was the thing. But I remember it going, I'm ready for that. <laughs> <That's> what, <laughs> as, a, as a kid wanting to get into the business, I went, I'm, I'm ready. That's what it takes. Yeah. And then you read, the, you hear the horror story. Like, JC Ace would tell me um, he'd, he'd go to wrestling school and he'd get beaten up and he'd get his bones broken. And at one time, they, they broke his bones and they... they they fucked him up. They fucked him up. JC Ace, legend of wrestling as well. Absolute legend. Um, and in the end, he kept going back, not because he wanted to be a wrestler, just to fuck him off. Because he knew <laughs> they'll, cut, they'll break an arm, he'll come back, they'll break a leg, he'll come back. He just kept going back. And eventually they went, all right, we'll let you in. You've passed the test. That's what it was like before we got in the business. So, you know, it's kind of like evolving the business and letting... letting like old traditions die. I think that's one of them that we can all agree we we don't need. Um, so yeah, I can't again. Can't point getting old. <laughs> it's it, it's kayfabe, Barbs. You're know, presuming back, you know, back in the day. You know, they had to protect the business. You couldn't just let anybody in off the street. 
you know you had to put them through these obviously not trials like that that's freaking extreme but yeah. you know you kind of had to make sure they were willing to take a little bit of pain to then be able to entrust them with the secrets of the trade kind of thing i guess so yeah i mean <clears throat> like if you look at someone like hulk hogan hulk hogan had to learn like he if you've seen his early matches in japan that guy could wrestle like yeah. i mean he could wrestle so and then you read his book he got fucked up he got bones broken this broken but it was kind of like look dude you got to learn to wrestle and he learned to wrestle he he broke his bones and he he, he was shoot fighting basically for two years until in, in one match he went out there and they suddenly went why they going really light i don't understand oh oh okay so this is wrestling then and that took, <laughs> like, three or four years of broken bones yeah, but if you watch Hogan, like I love watching early Hogan, like early Hogan stuff in Japan when he wore the white pants as well, his early w AWA stuff. Um, like again, like I, I, he's a big influence to me, Hogan, Hulk Hogan. I think everyone needs to be a character. He's a great example of what kind of like the charisma and the energy you need to be a pro. He doesn't look like your next door neighbor, nor should anyone in wrestling. I hate it when these kids look like they took a gap year from college and they're like four four stone white pal kids. It's the, it's not an insult, but it's kind of like there should be a certain level of professionalism mm -hmm. from them as well to understand that you know this is a this is a show as much as it is a a sport, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think you see that on um, the posters. I kind of. I was speaking to the guy who runs GPW uh, a few weeks ago, and his his, his big bugbear is, you know, anybody at works, he shows he wants it, like a, to be in a physique. But I think you see that as obviously the longer they're in the business, the more they train. When you look at posters for shows that cost a fiver, nobody's yeah. in really really good shape, yeah. but they're just yeah. starting out. But then yeah. you see you see the posters for shows that cost 40, 50 quid. Yeah, like those those dudes look the shit kind of thing. Yeah, I mean. Uh, I'm not again. I'm not, everyone's got to learn, right? Everyone's got to learn somewhere and start somewhere. That's that's totally fine. So it's when you willingly know that and you just decide not to from sheer laziness. It's like, well, you shouldn't be a pro. As a, it's called pro wrestling for a reason. Act professional. When you're starting off, it's fine. Look at Davy Boy when he started off. You know, he was like five stone, and you know. So, but there's a certain place for them people starting out on a card. You know, and you, that's how you build, you build them up as names, and you follow their career from day one to day two to becoming the champion, to becoming this, and with that comes a natural elevation and progression of yeah. uh, professionalism. There's, there's that, that's fine, but to pop those guys front and center on your poster probably isn't the best for anyone because what also you don't want to do is is fuck up their confidence, you know, because they might not want to do it again. So it's like if I was running a show. I would always put someone who looks larger than life in the front, front and centre. Like, you, have you heard of a wrestler called Flatliner? No. Nope. The Flatliner is, again, a, a big all-star wrestler. If I'm running the show, the first person I'm booking would be Flatliner. Right. Looks like Hulk Hogan, bald head, big silly beard, and he tags with little legs. Have you heard of little legs? No. Nope. Little one legs is about, about two foot high, and he sits on his show. <laughs> Boom, that's your poster. And just pot wrestling. Don't pot some stupid mark name like 79 gigawatts, whatever. Some, you know, doesn't mean shit to anyone. So all you need on a wrestling poster is the word wrestling and someone who looks larger than life. And that's, yeah. that's what it should be, you know, personally. That's what I think. Anyway. That is what wrestling is at its core, its basics. It should be. Uh, an entertaining show it should be good versus bad um and like I say characters um which are, the best characters uh, just uh, just ask pick your brain on this the best characters are they a source of yourself turned up to 11 or is it just could you be totally different to how you are and just use it as a release <clears throat> it's a good question because it's a little bit of everything like a lot of people say so you, your character should be you up to 11. Uh, the, for me, I was the, the pucker one, Darren Burroughs. That's like the most successful gimmick. It was me turned up to 11. In fact, that I was an Essex boy, you know, and the original gimmick was being Essex boy. But then 
and Essex boys wear, wear Burberry and they drive XR two eyes. <laughs> Fortunately for me, at that time, this word called chav came around. <laughs> and they evolved into a chav because because I said to myself, well, I'm a chav now. I was an Essex boy, but okay, so Essex boys are this thing called chavs, and in Yorkshire these things are called chavs, and in Chavis, chav. okay, cool. So I'm a chav then. I'm the king of the chavs, and that's why it worked for me. I I was myself that was 11 and then now I adapted it through social events modern history events and I think that's another thing with pro wrestlers work with what's happening in your environment and work with what's happening in the news and, and society and the way we think and all things we do because that's going to help you with your gimmick so yes it is you turned up to a certain extent but it also needs to reflect something that's happening in society that's how you, for me, I think you get the most out of your gimmick. And don't be afraid to play around that formula, pulling it back and pushing it into the next, next, uh, the next step of your promotion. But I think the important thing with, with characters is you have to ask yourself, what is your fourth dimension? You know, so what is it what makes this character four dimensional? A good example of what I think is a four dimensional character is someone like Raven or Kane. Kane's fourth dimension is that he has this backstory of the Undertaker that can lead through many paths, you know? So it's almost like sometimes a dimension that we can't see the fourth dimension. So it's kind of like a, a good example of what a fourth dimension is. Like, even if we can't see it, what's your energy for being how you became who you are, you know? And then from that, you kind of get your move set, maybe. Oh, you know, like, I'm yeah, a big yeah. fan of Street Fighter too. Because if you look onto that game, everyone's got a fourth dimension, a backstory, and all of their backstories and their dimensions are uh, they reflect in their move set, right? Blanka, he grew up in a jungle, and some sort of mutant thing took him over. Okay, so that's why he has his electricity because he bites the eels, and the eels are giving him electricity for his body. Okay, cool. So that explains why he does that. The Hadouken. There's been films about Ryu and Ken's power of channel in the Hadouken but that gives that move a fourth dimension and when you take like Sagat Sat was fucked Sagat was fucked up by the Hadouken so he has the to song. Yeah. yeah totally but then he counted that and he learnt his own version with the tiger yeah. yeah so when you're doing Ryu versus Sagat and he throws that fireball but Sagat counters oh, it's because he took the move and now he has this that's your fourth dimension that's what I mean by having a, a strong fourth dimension then you get amazing matches <clears throat> like Kurt Angle, Eddie Guerrero. I mean, Kurt Angle stuck the ankle lock on Eddie Guerrero. But Eddie Guerrero, technique and his background, the way he is, and the, we lie, we cheat, we steal, forward roll because his boot was undone, gets him in his own move. That's fourth dimension. That's also under promise over deliver. And that's what wrestling should be in terms of storytelling. Because with all these different elements, you can plan your match. You can plan your story. Um, and this is what, every single wrestler needs what is your fourth dimension what makes you you what makes your character stand out if you can't figure out a fourth dimension if you're just playing two dimensional wear a pants and go out and wrestle you're not going to go far you're not going to get book, booked a lot you know so i think it's important when you're coming out of a character yes kind of be yourself when you're up to 10 but if you if you're not if you can't be that what's my fourth dimension you know what's my story and that's it. I was going to say, if people don't get the fourth dimension um, analogy description, in layman's terms, what's your origin story? Pretty much. What's your origin? Yeah. Yeah. That's it. What's the origin of the character? What have they been through? What's the emotions? What's, you know, what's the drive? And uh, yeah, Bob's your uncle. Like you said, then you, you've got a, a clean slate to work moves, to work promos, to work appearance. You know, yeah. you, you can basically just go, you hit the that ground running. Yeah, again, that doesn't mean you have to come out like the postman, your mailbag. That's not what we're <laughs> saying. It's just, what is it about you that's made you you? But how can you make that more? Well, like, if, if I was to see a silhouette of you, would I know it's you? If I was to silhouette you and see you walk, would I know it's you? Yeah? yeah. So th that's what a fourth dimension is. That's the important thing. You don't have to be crazy. Look at, look at Austin. Austin wore black pants, you know, and he had no hair. and wore, Like, he hasn't had, the, he hasn't got a lot of about him, but Dude, he's got a lot of fourth dimension about him, and the and the the way he got to where he is, and the, the story he told of um, 
him with McMahon, the working class versus the upper elites. You know, that's what he was. That's that's what he embodied. So again, with your with your character design, who do I embody? Who do I who do I speak for? You know, who do I speak against is another great thing. Like Mexican wrestling, the good thing about Mexican wrestling is I was very fortunate to get trained by a lot of the Mexican legends through the London School Literally Liberated. We was very had a very tight connection with them and like uh, Hijo de Santo, Humanito Guerrero, Cassandro, oh. all these legends, Blue Blue Demon, they would all come down to the to, to school and we'd do shows together. But we learned a lot about <clears throat> Mexican wrestling, and if you watch Mexican wrestling, like in terms of a lot of people are masked, so they can't talk so much, but they embellish their gimmicks through their movement and their body language, and also their ring gear, and their ring gear sometimes some of them it associates to like a, like a, a political party that everyone hates in like for instance one of the latest ones is i don't you can remember they came out like a, a trump supporter they're bringing an american and he had his blonde <laughs> hair blonde and he has wow. a supporter came out of american flag american ties brilliant straight away we know we want to boo you he hasn't yeah. need to get on the mic because it needs to do any of this so sometimes it it, 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 it Embellish is something that we want to hate and we want to boo, but then you'd have this like a like a mask that represents the, the, the bad political party in in Mexico, and then the other guy that came out would have a mask that represents the good party. So naturally, the bad party would be the hills, you know. Okay. And then you know you do this crazy stuff, and then boom, like again, no no major storytelling, but the guy jumps up the rope, does a, a forward flip, lands on the guy on the outside, you know. Crowd got absolutely wild. Now the important thing of why I say this because Mexico is a constantly like it's 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 like uh, there's a lot of crazy tension in that country. There's a lot of poverty. There's a lot of violence. There's a lot of everything going. A lot of corruption. A lot of the people go to Mexico to watch the wrestling as a release so what you need to do is give them that pressure valve release and they say that the wrestling in mexico is a big reason that the crime isn't as big as it is because a lot of frustration so the fans go there they get immersed in these storylines they get they want to fucking hate the trump character to the point where they want to get in there and beat him up themselves but they don't have to because the you know the pro right. mexico character has gone in and he's smashing out of every chair you know <laughs> So they said it was a massive pressure valve release. That's great because that's why you should be coming to a wrestling show. That's why the All Stars are important because you go there and you embellish something that the crowd hate. You know, a movement, a social story, whatever. That's what a hill should be because they want to see the good guy, the lower class, the, you know, the working class wrestler be the other person. Again, that could be your gimmick. Your gimmick is just a working class hero. You're the Austin. But it's important. These things are important because it's important for fans to suspend their disbeliefs for a second, but to forget about all of the bullshit that goes on in the real in the real world. The cost of living crisis is one of them. You know, people haven't got a lot of money, so you better go in there and give them their money's worth and make them forget about all this bullshit. Come like that's going on in the world. That's our job as pro, as pro wrestlers. I don't want to go in there and watch some four stone idiot go and make me believe that he's just slapped some like kick some around the head. Right, you see him slap his knee like he's in some fetish club. So, like, that's that's the role of wrestlers, you know. So, again, it, that's why it's important to have, you know, a good character base. That's me going yeah. around. <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, around on. That's what I do. <laughs> but, like, yeah, like you say, at its core, wrestling is it's one of the purest forms of release. You know, it's one of the purest forms of entertainment. Um, I have just clocked the time. Uh, so I don't want to keep you too, too long, but. Uh, I do just want to ask you uh, a quick question. Somebody asked me to ask. So yeah. I've kind of got to. Um, Expendables 4. Yes. Uh, did you get to chill with the Expendables boys? And are they as cool as you would think they are? Well, I, get, well, I don't know how much I can say, but I, I got into stunt work from wrestling. So like, basically what happened was, let's just touch on this quickly. So um, I was a pro wrestler for a long time. Um, wanted to get into the stunt world. Um... I basically I got my lucky break because of the uh, the credit crunch back in 2007. So all these companies couldn't afford to bring in proper stuntmen because there was too much money. But they could bring me in because oh, the guy that does the wrestling could fall over. We'll bring him in. And that's 
up loads of doors. I did loads of like like stunt work through being a pro wrestler. So I got brung on because it was a specialist skill. And that was in 2000. My first job was in 2007. So from that, I became Greg the Wrestler. Oh, we get Greg the Wrestler in Greg Wrestler. So I built up my name's a specialist stuntman through pro wrestling. That's how I adapted my, my fight style with my, 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 st- my stunt team, Bulge Fight Design, where we learned how to um, infuse pro wrestling techniques with stunt work. And we make our own films. We made London Rampage and we just made my second one called Death Pit, which will be out soon. So basically, um, you know, I, I worked on like, things like Harry Potter. I did Dracula Untold. And through um, just working my way out the business and people seeing my films and knowing who I was, I got the chance to work on Expendables 4. Um, and I can't say loads about it, but I, I, I should probably wait till it's out. But it was all the bullshit that I've put up with in pro wrestling for 22 or years. Uh, all the things that I, 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 I did and... Like things like going to Holland and Barrett and buying milk and egg protein batter. <clears throat> That's all we had back in the day and chucking it back in a bowl to the point of gagging because we there was no things like these whey protein shit you have to There wasn't that. And all these things you did to have to do to be a pro wrestler. It was all worth it. Like going to a camp show, realizing you left one boot in the change room, getting your mum to drive you 50, 60 miles back to the building to pick up your Essex boot because you had to buy new ones. You know, all of the bullshit that I went through in my career was all worth it for this one moment being Expendables for. Um, nice. So yeah, it it's going to be wicked, man, when it comes out. Um, um, yeah, I was just I just did stunt work on it and helped a bit yeah. with the choreography. You got to meet. Oh, so hopefully you got to meet Tony Jaa as well. Dude, I'm I've only ever wanted to be in a film with Tony Jaa. That's my whole reason I wanted. He was the reason I got into pro wrestling, um, stunt work. You know. My total main reason i love this film um i just wanted to work in the time movie industry that was my thing it didn't work out that way but um i i didn't do a scene with tony jar but i am in a film with tony jar i'll take that you know yeah. but then all this stuff won't happen if i weren't wrestling i wrestled i made my own film london rampage that opened some doors i ended up working with scott atkins um as i can see again <laughs> Nice. You get my tooth knocked out with Scott. Scott, <laughs> um, opening doors with him and all these other people, and and just being larger than life got to me. Got but basically got me on Expendables Four. So uh, yeah, I, I I'll, let's wait till it comes out. But I did assist with one of the stunts in there with um with one of the throws and stuff. So yeah, it's uh nice. it'll be fun when that comes out. Right. Um, I think we should wrap it up based on, on that. I think that's a really good high note. Um, and yeah, obviously, I don't if you want to plug your socials, if you want to obviously promote, uh, just, you know. Oh, I know you've got a uh, you got a sh- have you got a show coming up at Doncaster with a, another promotion? So yeah, it's Pro Wrestling Zero. This is yeah. um, it's the progress guys that are running it. But again, like we were talking about earlier. Like you have your progress, which is aimed at a more smart audience. This is totally going to be a family friendly vibe. This is the other style of wrestling. The style that isn't get, going to get reported on cage match. You know, that's the whole aim of pro wrestling zero, getting the families in, being that pressure valve release and let, letting the, the families have a more affordable, better time at a pro wrestling show. So that's what we'll be doing at uh, the Doncaster's leisure center somewhere in Doncaster. I can't remember. Yeah. Um, I'll I'll plug a link um because I've yeah, I saw it a, a few weeks ago and yeah. it's just the card itself, mate, looks amazing to be fair. So I think anybody would be an idiot to miss it. Uh and like I say if it just sounds like it's gonna be a, a good fun show, you know, yeah, be there. Um if you guys are in London, come to my school, pro wrestling, barrage fight design. Um we don't just treat teach you pro wrestling, we teach you elements of acting and stunt work so you can join my stunt team. Um, and we get, we always get um, get you guys work on stunt films, whether I'm the fight coordinator or it's just the stunt work. So if it's something you did want to get into, um, please come down to the school. And we'll teach you not only to be a pro wrestler, we'll teach you to be a fucking superstar. Basically, that's what action hero. That's what pro wrestlers are. We're action heroes. So yeah, come down to Burridge Fight Design. Um, look me up on Instagram, Greg Burridge or Burridge Fight Design, either or. 
and uh, live your dreams, isn't it? Go out and do it. Dude, um, it has been an actually genuine uh, honour. Um, yeah, I feel educated and I feel a little bit wiser after this conversation. So thank you. Uh, thank you for watching.